Mr. Rooney, what do you remember about vaudeville? Oh, well, you know, I'm 90 years old, and uh, you're, you're, it wasn't yesterday, but vaudeville, there, there was burlesque before vaudeville. Vaudeville is, is just sort of not, a, not there any longer. No, I just heard of people that were trying to get a buck or so, make some money in the days. Well, and that was always tough. Were they received, were vaudevillians received well when they went into the small farming towns? Yeah, but uh, they weren't, there was no home for them. They had to keep traveling. Million people that were in Waterville, and you find people that were rude, like Eddie Cantor and, and uh, Buster Keaton. You've got Milton Berle who was in Waterville early, and uh, Milton Berle, funny guy. Yeah. I remember Fred Astaire. Texaco Hour. Well, Fred Astaire was was a dancer, and one of my dear friends. I've got a picture up here. He signed to me. Charlie Chaplin was born in England when he came over here and he, he had been in stand-up places and he, he didn't start with the big shoes. He wrote all the music and uh, directed the pictures and what a genius. And I, I was lucky enough to have met him. He invited me to his house and you know what he played for me? It's the latest song. He said, you want to hear the latest song I wrote, Mickey? And I said, yes, Mr. Chaplin. He said, I'll play it for you. And he sang, smile when your heart is lonely. Smile when you think of me only. Although there's a tear in your eye, you'll get by. And he sang the song. And of course, he wrote many, many other great songs. If, if this was like back in uh, 1915 and, and somebody wanted to join. Wait a minute. Oh, sorry. I wasn't born until 1920. Okay, um, the, like if I, uh, supposing like back in the days of vaudeville, I wanted to join a vaudeville circuit, how, how would someone go about doing that? You gotta think you're funny or do a dance or something and have somebody say, I'll, I'll put you on. That's, was that, that's the way it worked. Okay. And then if, uh, if they liked you, you stuck around. Yeah, and if they didn't like you, you were gone. <laughs> the important thing is to do the best with every minute you have and be nice to everybody and kind. And of course, people, they think a lot of people in the industry are fresh and they don't know. And you'll find some of these people, I don't want to mention any names, but always think of the other person. That's what I believe in. And believe, believe in their goodness. Right.
Sometimes, extra efforts are what make all the difference between success and failure. Edgar took Charlie McCarthy abroad to Iceland, England, Sweden, and Russia. His popularity grew and he improved his publicity and fan base. But vaudeville declined with the advent and growth of motion pictures. So during the 1930s, Edgar improvised and gave ventriloquist shows at nightclubs. Between shows, Edgar performed at parties. In 1936, there was a splendid party being thrown for the great playwright, Noel Coward. Edgar was going to give a show at that event. He needed to be at his best. been asking me for the last two days, why put a ventriloquist on the air? The answer is, why not? True, our ventriloquist, Edgar Bergen, is an unusual one, sort of Noel Coward or perhaps Fred Allen among ventriloquists. A dexterous fellow who depends more upon the cleverness and wit of his material than upon the believe it or not nature of his delivery. At Elsa Maxwell's most recent Star Spangled Party, the local smart set went smartly mad over Mr. Bergen and currently he is entertaining the white tie folks at the Rainbow Room. Mr. Bergen works with a dummy, several of them in fact, but this one is a typical ventriloquist dummy except that it is arrayed in top hat and tails. Just imagine the dummy and take my word for it that both voices you will hear are owned and operated by just one man, Edgar Bergen. Would you tell me if there's any work in sight? Any work? Yes. <laughs> You're interested in the position? Uh, mildly, yes. I see. <laughs> well, yes, Charlie, I do see a position here. Oh, goody, goody, goody. Yes. I suppose you would like to know something about the nature of this work? Uh, yes, I would. Yes. And something about the future of the position? Uh, yes, I would, yes. And uh, something about the salary, too. The salary, yes. <laughs> of course there is the salary. Well, I hope so, yes. Yes. Well, the salary, it would be a small starting salary. A small starting salary. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it will start. Oh, it will start, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, could you say how small? Well, no, I can't say that. Uh, they don't make money that small. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but I'm sure they will pay you what you're worth. Yeah, well, I would be interested in that kind of money. Oh, I see. <laughs> but I'm afraid the position won't do you much good. Why, well, what's the matter? Well, it seems that, it seems that your cocktail parties interfere with your work. Oh, I wouldn't say that. It looks very bad, young man. Oh, well, I, I never, I never overdo those things. Oh, you don't? No, I never, I never take more than a, a four or five scotch and sodas. Four or five scotch and sodas? Yeah, that's all, that's all, that's all. Oh, my goodness. What's that? Why, I should think four or five scotch and sodas would make you awfully drunk. Yeah, well, it helps, it helps. <laughs> Don't you know, young man, that alcohol? Yes. Alcohol, it's nothing but slow poison. Is what? It's slow poison. Is that so? Yes. Slow poison? That's what it is. <laughs> slow poison. Yes. Well, I'm in no hurry. Well, then it's all right. <laughs> Noel Coward attained a spot for Edgar and Charlie on the Rudy Valley radio show, and their fame commenced. In May of 1937, Edgar earned his own radio program. Chase and Sanborn Coffee was the sponsor. Radio was, by far, the primary mode of mass entertainment. 
and Edgar Bergen's show had one of the highest ratings. In those days, you know, there were many people who went to church, and then you had a family luncheon, and then you were allowed to go out and play, and then you had to be home at a certain hour, and you generally have pretty early dinners on Sunday, 5 o'clock, or at about 6 o'clock, the radio shows would happen. In our household, I mean, if you listen to nothing else, you would certainly listen to Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, but people of all ages liked it. That was the magic of the show. Um, people your parents' age, maybe your grandparents' age, and certainly yourselves, got a kick out of it. How do you do? How do you do? This is Cora Phelps. She's working. I do tell. Well, you needn't look jealous. It's only a walk-on. I appear in the third act and say, I'm Jeffrey's wife. He's killed himself. Can you blame him? <laughs> Aren't you ashamed? A great big dummy like you making fun of my acting. It's my face, Red. I didn't know you were acting. <laughs> oh, isn't it wonderful? And everybody was kept riveted. But the next day, when you're out playing or on the way to school or whatever it was, people, kids, you know, at that day, walked to school in groups. Three, five, eight. Um, every neighborhood sent their little group and people would chat on the way and say, did you hear that or do you remember, you know, Charlie saying this to some Hollywood queen or something like that? Uh, 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 Bergen? Quiet, can't you see I'm trying to drink? Yes, but uh, Honey Honey didn't give Charlie Charlie any beer. <laughs> <laughs> I beg your pardon, I'll uh, get you some. Uh, <laughs> Here you are, Charlie, dear. Oh, last but not least, I thank you. I, uh, I, 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 I... Too much beer isn't good for little boys. Too much beer? No. Uh-huh. Well, you certainly took care of that. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, fine. Yeah? Yes. Oh, yeah. I will... <laughs> It's good. Yeah, well, I wouldn't know about that. No. <laughs> a ventriloquist. Can you beat that? I didn't think they existed anymore. When a house burns, you never know what's coming out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm going to like her. <laughs> <laughs> so it formed part of the grow-up experience um, in a very, uh, you know, lifting, nice, uh, way that uh, was acceptable, very acceptable family entertainment, and it did that. It had its own way of binding uh, people together, and from that point of view alone, uh, NBC, CBS, and others are to be commended. They, they did something uh, that did something in turn for the family. The pig wouldn't let him in, so the wolf huffed and he puffed. And he huffed, and he puffed, and he puffed, and he huffed. Watch it, Bergen. Don't blow your top. All right. <laughs> but the strong house stood firm. Oh, shucks. <laughs> Scratch the pork chops off the menu. All right. <laughs> I can do without your interruptions. I can do without your story. Now, now, please. 